love Hope City. Come on, give Hope it up City. for Jesus today. So, so good to be here. You know, the Bible says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. What that means is that you'll worship him on the level of your revelation of who he is. So, so if you see God as great, then you'll worship him as great. So that's why I say never, um, never throw shade on somebody's worship. You may look at people and be like, man, they're a little excited. I don't know what's wrong with them. But it could be that they've had the revelation that he's a healer of their body. So they worship him like a healer. It could be that he broke an addiction for them. So they worship him like an addiction breaker. It could be that there was no way through, but they found out he was a way maker. And so they worship him. So I just wonder if anybody's had a great revelation of a great God. Come on, Hope City. Every location. A great God deserves a great praise. Come on, give him five seconds. Hey! Hallelujah. Man, it's good to be in church today. You can have a seat. Aren't you thankful you're in the house of God today? Come on, you could be in prison. You're in church. You could be in the hospital, but you're in church. How many of you love your pastors? Pastor Daniel, Pastor Jackie. I don't know if they're watching, but I just want to say I honor you. I love you. The integrity you lead with, your character, the commitment, your family. I just, I'm so grateful to be in the house today and, and what great leadership that you have and I want to say hello to Cinco Campus, Woodlands Campus, Tanzania. Come on, somebody. Say hello to our online family. Come on, Hope City. Put your hands together and welcome our whole church family. And uh, speaking of family, I want to show you a picture of my family, the Floyd crew, the circus, I call them. When you got four kids, it's kind of like a circus some days. And uh, that's my wife, Tammy. We planted our church 17 years ago in uh, just south of Washington, D.C. Y'all pray for us, minister to a lot of people that work in the nation's capital, and he's all the prayer can get. It is everything you think it is. And uh, that's my son, Owen, he's 15. He gets his permit a week from tomorrow, y'all. I am one step closer to having my own Uber driver, and I cannot wait. We're getting there, that's my daughter, Faith. She's 13. And um, she is strong in every way you can think, and that's why there's a big gap. We didn't know if we wanted to make more humans. <laughs> didn't know if we had the energy for it, but we did. Abigail, she's five, and then the little guy on my lap, his name's Jonas, and uh, he's three, and he came to us at five days old. We adopted him, and he's just been the greatest joy. So that's our crew. They say hello. <laughs> and... Uh, just excited to be here. You ready for the word? I feel like there's faith in the house. I feel like we're ready to receive. I want us to look at Philippians chapter 3, and uh, then we'll get into the message. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 16. It'll be on the scripture, or the scripture will be on the screen if you don't have a copy of the Bible with you. And um, it's good to be in Texas, everybody. It's hot here, but it's good to be here. Should have no problem getting people saved in Texas. Just be like, it's like living outside for eternity, if you don't know Jesus. <laughs> All right, let's look at the Bible. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3. Paul says, not that I have already obtained. Aren't you encouraged that Paul's like, I'm not there yet? That should encourage you. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on. Somebody shout, I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Here's what Paul is saying, is I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay hold of something, I'm pressing to grab it, but it's the thing that's already grabbed me. In other words, Jesus got me first. He said, brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, one thing, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, and he says it again, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And I, I, I find humor in the Bible. I think Paul's being funny here in a way because he says, um, if you're perfect or if you're mature is a better word for the translation. If you're mature, have this attitude. 
And he says, and if anything, you have a different attitude. In other words, if you disagree with me, God will get you. He'll correct you. <laughs> Yo, I think that's funny. Paul's like, I'm right. You're wrong. Have the same mind. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. If you're a note taker, write this title down at all of our locations online. If you're not a note taker, write this title down. It'll help you. Um, write this down. We're going to talk about I'm pressing forward. I think it's time to press forward. Let's pray together. Father, we open our hearts and minds. We want to hear from you today. We haven't come to check a religious box or go through some ritual. We haven't come to just do some habit or routine in our week. We've come to meet with the living God. We believe your word is alive. It's powerful. So speak to us, transform us, change us, give us a new perspective, build our faith today. May we walk out of here being more like you. We love you. Pray this in Jesus' name. The church said amen. Amen. Hey, how, how many of you, your parents in the house, slip up your hand, your parents, and you're afraid, to, you're, you're glad to admit it? Some of you are like, I don't know if I'll admit it. So uh, if you're not a parent, I want to I wanna give you a little insight into something. Once you become a parent, there's two types of experiences that you go on. One is called a trip. A trip is when your children join you. The other is a vacation. Can I get an amen in that? <laughs> y'all know where I'm going. Vacation is when it's just you and the spouse. Are y'all following me? Trip is when they come, and they're awesome. You need them. Family time, you're building. But a vacation is when the children aren't with you. It's just you and or your wife. Are you with me? So last summer, um, right before my birthday, it was actually overlapping my birthday, um, I went on a vacation with two other couples. They're some of our closest friends. And um, we went on a vacation. Now, my idea of vacation may not be your idea of vacation, but I think mine's right. <laughs> and I, so I don't understand people that go on vacations. I understand trips where you have a lot of activities because you got to keep the kids busy and, you know, do these things. I don't understand people that go on vacations and they stay busy the whole time. Like, we're going to get up in the morning. We're going to go hike up a mountain. We're going to look at the sunrise. I don't care when the sun gets up. We're going to, are y'all following me? I'm on vacation. Like, I don't understand all that. Y'all, so I had a friend that just did like a six week RV out to, I was like, why would you drive your hotel room? I don't understand. <laughs> that, but some people are into it. Like, I don't get it. But so, but so I get up in the morning when I want to, I go lay by the pool that is close to the beach. I don't want to be on the beach because there's a lot of sand. I just want to hear the waves. <laughs> well, someone's come by and asked me, Mr. Floyd, would you like anything to eat? You need anything? No, I'm good right now, but I'm gonna have lunch in a little bit. I get up and go to lunch. I go back and lay back in the same position again. Are y'all following me? <laughs> Then around three, I want to go to the room and take a nap because I'm exhausted from all I've done all day. Then I want to get dressed and I want to go to a nice dinner. I want to spend three or four hours in great conversation, enjoying great food and a great experience. I want to get up and do that again the next day, right? So that's my idea of a vacation. So we're on this vacation, but one of my, one of my really good friends, he's on our team, our chief of staff, he's a former Navy special operator. So he's a little bit more adventurous, you know, he's like done some things and things that he can't say and all that. And so he's like, one day he's like, I, I found an excursion we should go on. I was like, all right. He said, they'll take us on a private boat, just the six of us. And I was like, who is this through? He's like, just some guy that was walking along the beach. I was like, this is shady already. <laughs> like, Just some random guy walking on the beach is like, I got a private boat. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure he does. <laughs> so we, we did it. We got on the boat. And the, the, the excursion was is that you swam into these caves that were um, on the sides of these cliffs. But they're, you, know, you swim right up in them. And he was like, one of them had Pirates of the Caribbean. A part of it was filmed. I was like, he's a liar. But you know, it sold the deal. And so we went. And then the last thing you did is you went cliff jumping. And I was like, I'm in. I, it was the last day I was 44. And I was, I know I look 35, but I was like 44, <laughs> turning 45 last summer. And I was like, let's go cliff jumping. And, and so my buddies go, some of the girls stay on the boat. And, um, and so we swim over, you know, and I, I felt like Ashton Kutcher in that like Coast Guard movie, you know, it's like the waves are crashing. I'm like, I'm coming. And so we get over and um, there's one that's like a 10 foot jump and a bunch of like kids are out there jumping. Then there's the one that's a 20 foot jump. So obviously we're stupid. We go to the 25 foot jump. 
And so we go up there and there, some of the locals are there and they're like, we're not lifeguards, we're just wanting you to read the sign. And it said, this could cause bodily injury, you're doing this at your own risk, you know, all that. And we we're like, Roger, we got it. And so we go over to the cliff, my friend, Navy, Navy guy, he like, you know, torpedo straight down and he swims away and he's like, it's awesome. So I get up and I'm looking over the edge because I'm thinking, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna hit rocks. I'm not trying to die on 44, you know. <laughs> got a three-year-old. So I'm, I'm looking over and, and so I'm like, I'm gonna jump out because I don't wanna hit anything and make sure I'm, I'm, you know, in the water. And so when I do, I jump, but I bend a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't stay, you're supposed to stay stiff as a pencil. If you ever do this, all right, just, this is free. It won't help your spiritual life, but it will keep you from injury. You're supposed to stay stiff as a pencil, so you hit the water and just go straight down. Well, I, I hit the water like this. And so the back of my thighs smacked the water from 25 foot up, and I had massive bruises on the back of both of my legs. Are y'all with me? And I could feel it in my back. And so I, I still gotta swim back to the boat, I get on and my wife goes, that didn't look good. (laughs) I said, it wasn't good. She's like, when'd you know it was bad? I was like, halfway down. (laughs) And, And I had back pain radiating through my shoulder blades for the rest, this was day two of the vacation, the rest of vacation, I was in pain the whole time. I went to the spa twice, got massages, trying to just get some relief, and it was bad. And I don't know about y'all, but whenever I get an injury or something or I don't feel right, like I go in a dark hole. Are y'all, are y'all with me? Like, I had myself, like, never, I was like, I'm gonna be on a walker. People are gonna have to buy me tennis balls for Christmas to put on the, you know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm never gonna roll around on the floor with my three-year-old. I won't, I won't be his t-ball coach. Like, are y'all, anybody else with me? Anybody else, like, you get a little ache, you go to WebMD and, like, you are ready, you're dead. You're like, that's it, I'm dying. I need to tell everybody good. Am I, come on, any, am I there? Be honest in the house of God. Anybody else with me? All right, so that's what happens to me. I, I, and I finally get back. I go to my chiropractor and he's like, basically you got whiplash. You're gonna be fine in six weeks. Like you, you basically just compressed your spine and then, you know, and, and you're gonna be good. And I was six weeks later visiting him every week. I was, I was good to go and, and my, I haven't had any problem. It didn't, you know, didn't affect my golf game. Pray, glory to God. Like that's what we were worried about. And so, but in that, in that time, this is what began to run through my mind. Daniel, you've got too much responsibility to be doing these dumb things. You need to play it safe. Like you've got children, you've got a church, you've got a school. I mean, you just got a whole lot of things you're responsible for and you can't be doing these kind of things. You, you need, and your body doesn't bounce back as fast in the 40s. You need to play it safe. And here's what the Spirit of God spoke to me in that moment. He said, you may need to do that in your body, but you better not play it safe with your faith. And this is what I wanna talk to you about today is this, is that I believe some of us have got to the edge and in some area of our faith, we jumped. God, I'm gonna believe you for this. God, I'm gonna trust you for that. God, I'm 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 gonna step out and take a risk in this area or that area. And we jumped, and when we jumped, it didn't end the way that we expected it to or thought it would. And so we've decided no more jumping for me. I'm just gonna stay as far away as I can from acts of faith and steps of faith. I'm just gonna get through, got my fire insurance, I wanna go to heaven, I I want that. I wanna go to heaven when I die. But I'm not gonna live this John 10, 10, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full kind of life. You've just decided, I'm just gonna settle in, kind of make it through and go to heaven one day. And I just kind of wanna shake you out of that if I could a little bit today. Be a friend to you and say, no, God has so much more for you and it's time to get back to the the edge again and go, no, God, you call me, I'll jump again. You speak, I'll obey again. In Adam Grant, in uh, throughout the pandemic, Adam Grant, a secular psychologist, wrote an article. I think, if I'm not wrong, it's the most downloaded article from the New York Times in its history. And he said that there is a middle child of mental health and it's called languishing. And it's not that people aren't, they're not thriving, but they're not depressed. They're just kind of, eh. It's kind of in the middle. And it's not that the marriage is fantastic and it's not that you're about to walk away from it. It's kind of like, just kind of settled. It's just kind of languishing. And it's not that you're thriving in your career, 
And it's not that you're wanting to walk away and you're gonna quit tomorrow. You're not joining the great resignation, but you're just kind of like, man. You just kind of don't expect anything great. And he said the, what happened is this, is that through the pandemic that we all went through, there were so many stops and starts, we decided to quit starting. So I planned the vacation, but now I have to cancel it because I need to quarantine. And I thought I was going back to work, but now I'm on the remote. And I thought the kids were going back to school, but no, they're, now they're back at home learning. And because there were so many stops and starts and stops and starts and plans interrupted, we just decided why even try to plan? And if you're not careful... Whenever you step out in faith and it doesn't go the way that you thought it was and you feel like you got stops and starts, but God, I thought it was gonna turn out good. God, I thought you were gonna do this, but God, I believe for it, but God, I went to 21 days of prayer and it didn't turn. You can begin to not thriving in your faith and you're not gonna walk away from your faith, but you're just kind of living life. And I just want to get something on the inside of you today, if I could, that says, I'm not gonna live languishing. I'm not gonna live a reasonable life. Whenever David came to the, are y'all with me so far? Whenever David came to the battlefield, we're going to get to the text. You're like, but you read a scripture. Are we going to that? We're going to that eventually. Whenever David came to the battlefield and he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that is um, calling out the armies of God? Y'all remember that David Goliath? You've heard that story, right? Nine foot giant, little boy, stones, a sling, right? So he comes and he says, who's that? And Saul came to him and he said, he came to Saul the king and he said, I'll take care of him. Nobody else is willing to go down. I'll go take care of him. And the text says this, that Saul said to him, David, don't be ridiculous. You're just a young boy and he's been fighting since his youth. I don't know about you, but I, don't, I, wanna, I wanna live a faith that's ridiculous. That when people look at it, they go, no, 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 no. How did you do that? I, I, I would rather, I'd rather be the one that jumps off the cliff than staying back here and not experiencing the miracle working power of God. Here's what David said. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Here's what David was saying in that moment is who is this guy that does not have the hand of God in the protection? That's what circumcision represented. It represented the people of God. They were set apart. They were consecrated for God. They had the favor of God. They had the blessing of God on them life. He's saying, who is this guy that does not have God's hand on him talking to us who have the backing and the hand of God on our life? And Saul goes, don't be ridiculous. He goes, no, no, no. I've already won the battle before I ever get in the valley because God is with me. Are y'all following me today? I just want to shake something on the inside of you that goes, no, I'm going to dream again. I'm going to believe again. I'm going to trust again. I'm going to lean into God again. It may not look great around me. Chaos may be around me. Chaos doesn't have to be in me. I'm going to trust again. And this is what Paul is talking about in the text. He says, I'm pressing forward. Pressing forward. I love that Paul says this one thing I do. This one thing I do. I think it's interesting. Paul could have said a lot, right? I mean, a lot of things that, that we would have commended as, as Christians. This one thing I do, I, I worship. That would have been great. Like worship invites, God inhabits the praises of his people. God invites, you know, we see Paul and Silas in jail. They begin to worship prison doors. I mean, all, all kinds of things happen in, in worship. That would have been a great one. This one thing I do is I pray, Right? I mean, nothing of eternal value ever has happened apart from prayer. Every great move of God started with prayer. Like this one thing I do, prayer would have been a great thing. This one thing I do is, is I meditate on the word of God. That would have been, you know, Apostle David said, I delight myself in the law of the Lord. I meditated on it day and night. Like that would have been a great, great thing to say. But he says, this one thing I do, I forget. That's interesting to me. It's one thing I do, I forget. Paul said, I forget what lies behind and I press forward. In other words, Paul is saying, for me to move forward, I've got to do both and. I've got to forget what is behind and I press forward to what is ahead. I forget. This is the one thing I do. I forget. Paul says, the one thing I do is I practice spiritual amnesia. I forget what is behind. I kind of wonder if Paul wasn't forgetting some of the mistakes that were behind him. I wonder if he said, in my pressing forward, I have to forget the failures of my past. I I just kind of wonder, this is just my kind of holy imagination. Are y'all with me? Say amen. I just kind of wonder if Paul wasn't going, you know, um, the enemy often brings up that I held the coat when they stoned, stoned Stephen and I got to forget some things so that I can press forward to some things. 
And I wonder if he remembers persecuting Christians and says, when the enemy brings that up in my mind, I've got to forget some things that are in my past so I can press forward to what is ahead. Because here's what I found is that the enemy will paralyze you and keep you languishing by reminding you of all the failures of your past. You can never serve in that way. You can never be used by God in that way. You, you, God, God doesn't want to do that through you. He'll do it through somebody else, someone on the platform, someone that's really been that, like super Christian, but he's not going to do it through your life because remember that thing you did? Remember what you did last night? And he will keep you stuck and paralyzed. And Paul goes, I've got to forget the things that are behind me. I've got to remember that his grace is sufficient, that his blood covers all of, come on somebody, that aren't you thankful his blood covers all of my sin? And he said, I'm forgetting what is behind. Some of you, you need like men in black moment. Go back and watch the movie. Like you need somebody to zap and and stop allowing the enemy to paralyze you with all the mistakes of your past. Because if not, it'll keep you languishing, it'll keep you paralyzed, keep you stuck, keep you from moving forward, keep you thinking, well, I'm just, I'm just fine if, if God, if like I, I just wanna go to heaven one day, but I don't expect heaven to come today, but my Bible says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So evidently, I'm supposed to live heaven today on the earth, and some of us, the enemy has talked us out of our destiny. And talked us out of dreaming because we are still living in the past. I think it's not just forgetting our mistakes, but I would also recommend that we forget our successes. Because some of us, we will get stuck in the nostalgia of how great it was way back when. Hello, somebody. How many of you know the further we get away from a success, the greater that success looks. Are y'all with me? A few years ago, my wife, we decided we we're gonna go to Disney, take the kids to Disney. And uh, we we're gonna drive there from Virginia. I live just south of Washington, D.C., y'all. That's a long drive, very long drive. And so we make the drive down, four kids. I mean, y'all saw the picture, four kids. We got tablets, we got music, we got Golf, I'm OCD about my car being clean, goldfish on the floor. Like I had to fast the whole time. Lord, help me, help my attitude. These kids are putting fries on my floor. <laughs> and so we, we make the drive. We, we drive there. I don't know if y'all know this. You have to drive back. <laughs> Getting there is fun. You're anticipating the week. It's going to be awesome. The week's over. You got to drive back. Are we there yet? No, we just left the parking lot. I vowed, I made a vow before the Lord and before my family, I'll never, ever. Like, I don't like driving you all to the grocery store. I'm never driving you to Orlando, Florida again. Are y'all following me? But a year later, my wife is like, maybe we should drive to Florida. Maybe we should like Airbnb a house and drive again. She goes, it wasn't that bad, was it? And I was like, no, I don't think, I don't, I don't think it was, that, I don't think it was that bad. Because the further you get away from something, the greater you make it look. Are you following me? Even your successes. And I think sometimes the successes can keep us paralyzed, living in the nostalgia of I wish it was the way it was back when, and we can get stuck and not move forward into everything God. And two things happen. One is we think we got ourselves here, and we think we can get ourselves into the future when we live in the past of our successes too much, or we get stuck. This is what too many churches are doing. I wish it was like back when, so and so, but blah, blah, blah. And God's like, no, I'm moving you from victory to victory, not from past to past. I'm moving you from glory to glory, not from last year to the year before to the year before. No, no, no. I'm not moving you backwards. I'm a God of forward. I'm a God of new. I'm a God of I'm doing a new thing. I'm a God of new mercies. Are you with me? And Paul says, I'm forgetting. Now, to understand the the. The weight and the power of this, you've got to understand what Paul was saying in, in, in understanding biblical forgetting. And biblical forgetting is the opposite of remembering. You're thinking, wow, you're a scholar. <laughs> and I'm a gentleman. Um, 
So to understand forgetting, you got to see it's the opposite of biblical remembering, which means you got to understand what does the Bible mean by remember. And it doesn't mean that you're just able to recall information. That's not what the Bible means when it says remember. When the Bible talks about remembering, it's talking about this idea that you dig up information or an experience from your history, you bring it into your present until it is, has potency or it affects your current situation. This is why God would tell the nation of Israel often, and he would say to people often throughout scriptures, remember the Lord your God, remember the works of the Lord your God. Tell these to your children, to your children's children, why? So that remember how God sent 10 plagues and he got you out of Egypt. Why do, what does remembering mean when he says that? Because you're gonna stand before a Red Sea and a Pharaoh bearing down on you, and you're gonna be overwhelmed with anxiety, and you're gonna lose faith, and you're gonna be freaking out. But if you remember, it means this. It means that you dig up and go, no, no. I saw him send the 10 plagues. I saw him cause Pharaoh to deliver us. And right now there may be a Red Sea in front of me and an army bearing down on me, but I've got faith in the middle of it. I've got peace that passes all understanding. I've got joy unspeakable and full of glory. I may be facing a diagnosis I didn't want, but I'm living by faith. My child may have walked away from God, but I'm believing for miracles. Why? Because I'm remembering the same God yesterday is the same today day and he'll be the same in all my tomorrows. So Paul says, I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting what is behind me. What did he mean? He goes, I'm not letting my past mistakes stall me out and cause me to languish. And I'm not allowing my past successes to keep me stuck and wishing I was living in yesterday. He said, I'm pressing Here's what I want you to understand, that if Paul is pressing, that means Paul's facing resistance. And if you're going to move forward and not languish and live this abundant life, this fully alive life that John talks about in chapter 10, verse 10, you're going to have to press. But when you press, don't be surprised that you face resistance. Some of you, you stepped out and you begin to press, lean into your faith. Join a dream team, get in community. You started being obedient in your finances. You started living this thing out Monday through Saturday. Sunday started infecting your whole week. And the moment you did, you're like, I feel like all hell broke loose against me. It was easier when I was living for me. But without resistance, you don't grow. I've been to the gym one time, I know you think I go every day. You're like, by the size of your arms, you look like you're there often. I appreciate that encouragement in the Lord. Thank you. Here's what I know is that if you never pick up heavier weights, you never grow stronger muscles. If you never face resistance, you never grow stronger faith. And so the very thing that you're trying to get out of your life, God could be using in your life to take you where he wants to take you. I think sometimes God thinks his kids are schizophrenic because we're over here like, God, use me. God, do something through my life. I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to wait on you. And we're singing all this. We're like, God, God, use me in my school. God, use, God, I want to grow. I want to be more like you. And then he's like, deal. Done. I'm in for this. And then you get some challenge in your life, some resistance come. And then next Sunday, you're over here. I rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus. God's like, hold up, what's happening? Why are you rebuking the thing I'm trying to grow you with? I thought you wanted to grow. I thought you wanted more faith. I thought you wanted to go glory to glory, victory to victory. I thought you wanted breakthrough and healing. And breakthrough only comes when you push through. And so God's more convicted, committed to you being conformed to his image than he is your comfort. Because when you conform to him, you become more like him. And your faith begins to grow. Paul said, I'm pressing. I'm shipwrecked, but I'm pressing. 
I've been called a God and a devil in the same moment, but I'm pressing. I've been thrown in prison, but I'm pressing. I'm just trying to tell Hope City today, you may be having some marriage issues, but keep pressing. You may be struggling, but keep pressing. Your kid may have walked away from God, but keep pressing. The finances may not be where you want them to, and gas keeps going up, but keep pressing. You may feel an anxiety in your heart, but keep pressing. I hope you get a press in your spirit. Somebody shout, I'm pressing. I'm pressing. Here's why you can press. Let me wrap up with this. Here's why you can press. Because he's moving you upward towards the call of Christ. In other words, there is a better tomorrow. He's not moving you from defeat to defeat. Paul said, I'm pressing because there's an upward call. Here's what Paul was saying. I have faith that what God is doing is taking me upward. I have faith to believe that God is moving me upward. And so I'm gonna keep pressing and I'm gonna keep pressing and I'm gonna keep pressing. Do you receive the word of God today? Come on, every head bowed, every eye closed. Many of you today, it's not about faith to believe God for something that you're in need of. For some of you today, it's, it's faith to receive the forgiveness that Jesus offered through his death and his resurrection. And the step that you need to take today is to put your faith in him to forgive you, cleanse you, to give you a brand new beginning. The Bible says that we have all sinned. And that's not a statement to condemn you. It's the reality of the human condition. We were born that way. If you don't believe me, you haven't had a toddler. We're all born with sin. It's a problem and, and none of us could solve it. So God sent his only son, Jesus, into the world to live the life that you and I could never live and die a death that we deserved. So that by simply placing our faith in him, not by our works, not by our effort, not by pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, but simply by trusting in him, our sins would be forgiven. Heaven would be our home and we have a brand new start today. Some of you, you need that today. You know in your heart that you're far from God. You know when you lay your head down on the pill at night, no one's around and you're just thinking about what life is really about, you don't have peace. You don't have the confidence of a relationship with Jesus. I'm not inviting you to join this church, it's a wonderful one. I'm inviting you into a relationship with a loving God who loved you so much that he gave his only son. So in just a moment, we're gonna pray together. There's nothing magical in the prayer, it's just me helping you communicate your desire to God. Before we do that, with no one looking around at any location, even online, we wouldn't embarrass you for the world. I just wanna know who I'm praying with. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you say, Pastor, that's me, I, I need a fresh start today. I need a new beginning. When I count to three, you just shoot your hand up high enough, long enough for me to see. Then you can put it down, and then we'll pray together. If that's you, you'd say, I need a fresh start today, that's me. I want a new beginning, I wanna know my sins are forgiven. On three, you shoot your hand up high enough, long enough for me to see. On three, one, two, three, you just shoot it up. Praise God, all over the room. All over the room, amazing. I see you, you can put them down. Church, let's pray this out loud for the benefit of those who just slipped up their hand. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I believe you died for me. I believe God raised you from the dead. Today, I make you my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen, come on, let's celebrate those who made that decision. God bless you, Hope City.